Um, we're so lucky to have uh, uh, Johan Wokström with us to talk about uh, tipping points, which perhaps not, might not all be the solutions to tipping points. So uh, this morning is like the only morning in the whole Solutions House agenda when we're allowed to have this conversation, but it's such an important conversation to have. And it is my great pleasure to hand over to Owen Gaffney to get us started off this morning. Owen. Cool. Thanks, thanks, Solly. And thanks so much for, for joining us um, for breakfast. And, um, and really the framing for today uh, um, the session is on is on tipping points. We're, we're going to talk about earth system tipping points and, and some of the most profound findings from the research community um, it, over the last few decades were published um, uh, just uh, on the 8th of uh, uh, September, uh, two weeks ago, this uh, uh, today in fact. And uh, you may recall two weeks ago today, uh, the, 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 the Queen passed away. And half an hour after that news was published, uh, a major paper was uh, published in the, the world's leading academic journal, um, Science, uh, led by Johan Rockström and uh, uh, David McKay Armstrong, and uh, some, of the, some of the most influential tipping points researchers from the Potsdam, from Stockholm Brazilian Center, from the Earth Commission, from Exeter University. A really um, a very profound paper. And then a few days after that paper, and Johan's going to talk about that in a second, a few days after that paper, just last week, uh, we held the first Tipping Points conference um, at Exeter um, in the UK. And this was a very, very important moment because um, this brought together some leading thinkers on both system tipping points, but also on social tipping points. How do we really uh, drive uh, and scale change uh, at an exponential level um, that uh, on the kind of scale we haven't seen before, but we know that social tipping points in, in other areas of, uh, of social life um, you know, things can change very, very rapidly. Um, so how do, we, how do we trigger social tipping points to get to the kind of scale of change we need to see now? Because this really is a planetary emergency we're facing. And on that, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Owen. And um, good morning. And thanks for making the exception of um, talking about uh, diagnostics. Um, but I would argue very strongly that that is part of the solution because if we don't get uh, the diagnostics of uh, the state of the patient right, we will never get a good cure. So um, the, the journey I think it's worth uh, mentioning starts in 2008 with the first publication of the Tipping Elements paper, an iconic paper that scientifically brought forward the evidence that uh, we, we appear to have 15 big biophysical systems on Earth that regulates the state of the climate system. That was actually the basis for developing the whole planetary boundary framework. So the planetary boundaries are set scientifically to keep the tipping point systems on the right side of the fence, the fence that supports our economies, societies, humanity, and that is a safe operating space. And that was published in 2009. Ten years after the tipping point paper 2008, we did the first decadal update. And that was a paper that came out in 2019 that showed that nine of the 15 tipping element systems are showing signs of instability. And among those nine, I mean, it will come as no surprise to you, we have the Green Ice Sheet, we have the whole overturning of heat in the North Atlantic, the AMOC, the Amazon rainforest, the tropical coral reef systems, permafrost thawing in Siberia, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, you know, big systems that scientifically are shown to fulfill two criteria. One is that, yes, they do contribute to control the state of the entire climate system, therefore the livability for humans and all species on Earth. But secondly, they have multiple stable states <coughs> separated by tipping points. <clears throat> so push them too far and feedback dynamics change direction and they go from one attractor to another attractor. They tip over a fence and they irreversibly change state. So this is science that has been advancing over the last 30 years. But one answer was still missing. At what temperature levels are we at risk of pushing these on buttons of irreversible change when they go from one state to another? We've actually not had that answer. There's been tremendous uncertainty ranges in the so-called scientific red embers diagram that shows you know, that some of these, like green and ice sheet, we've been able just scientifically to say it's somewhere between 1.5 and 4 degrees. You know, not, not very satisfactory. It's either like a manageable state or a catastrophic warming that we haven't seen for the past five million years. <clears throat> but science has been advancing. And in the sixth assessment of the IPCC, as you know, that came out in August 2021, for the first time, 
There's a table there listing the 15 tipping element systems, tipping element systems defined as such by the IPCC, but there's a column there saying low confidence, low confidence, low confidence on where is the temperature threshold. So we set out to answer that question three years ago with a major effort, as Owen pointed out, and that was published two weeks ago for the first time, and it, therefore, in, in my mind, one of the most important scientific advancements in, in, in kind of guiding our transformation to a safe landing. And unfortunately, but not surprisingly, the answer or the message of that science is really dire. So one is that we have now a list with high degree of scientific certainty of, of which are the tipping element systems. I really recommend you to have a look at this. 15 big systems. There's a supplementary information there with a long, long list of you know, candidate systems that have been so they're thrown out of the list because they don't really fulfill these two big criteria. So just to tell you that the Arctic sea ice and the, the jet stream, which we always talk of as tipping point systems, are actually not fulfilling the, the really tough criteria because they change, yes, but they change linearly and there's no evidence of abrupt irreversible shifts from one state to another. So I can assure you that the list of 15 we now have has fulfilled really tight scientific criteria. And the assessment is the following, that four of these 15 are likely to cross tipping points already at 1.5. And they are at risk of crossing tipping points even below 1.5. We cannot exclude crossing tipping points already today at 1.2. That's the message. And I can tell you that even we that worked with this uh, for three years, we're not shocked in any way because we've been working on this all the time. But when you get the synthesis together and that the temperature levels of risk are so low, it was actually quite, you know, it, it, it shook us. Which are these systems then? Well, the number one, believe it or not, is the Green Ice Sheet. So the most likely range of risk of tipping points is at 1.5 for the Green Ice Sheet, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. Together, these two hold 10 meter sea level rise. So of course, if we cross the tipping point at 1.5, it's not that the whole system just collapses and gives us 10 meter sea level rise overnight, but it would be irreversible. This is what, what the youth movement in the world are starting to understand, that we would irreversibly commit all future generations to a, to a sliding slope towards an unstoppable, you know, less and less livable Earth system. The third one are the tropical coral reef systems. I mean, we've known for a long time that this is victim number one, and now we have it confirmed. At 1.5, we're very likely to lose all tropical coral reef systems. They said we cross their tipping point in terms of bleaching events, they cannot recuperate. And the fourth one is abrupt thawing of permafrost in Siberia, up in the Arctic. So permafrost, West Antarctic, Greenland, tropical core systems, the first four, the batch at 1.5. What does this mean then, to close? Well, of course, it means that 1.5 in the Paris Agreement is a damn good number. And isn't it fantastic that the world actually rallied around that number in 2015, even before we had the science? But so many politicians just misunderstand this as some kind of political compromise. Oh, well, we're starting to miss 1.5, let's go for 2. Or let's go for something a bit higher even. What we show is that 1.5 is a planetary boundary. You cannot negotiate with it. You want to stay below it. And there's a lot of science now supporting it. So that is why I would call that a lever for solutions, not as a threat for doom, but a lever for solution. Over. Thank you. So, uh, and then, so how do we act on this? We know that to, for, for some chance of staying, you know, um, around 1.5 or um, just, um, uh, 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 we, Paris Agreement has, has committed us to, uh, to stay as close to 1.5 as possible. Um, what does that mean? We know that um, as a bare minimum, we need to halve emissions by 2030. So within eight years, we need to do that. You know, that's approximately 100 months. Uh, we need to be on that trajectory. We're nowhere near that right now, um, uh, obviously, and uh, we're, we're not reducing um, at anything like the kind of scale um, we need to do that. We also published a report earlier this week with Conservation International. Um, we talked about it here yesterday that um, on land use, we need to become uh, net zero with land use by 2030 in 100 months. Uh, so those two things, halving emissions um, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases and 
uh, net zero uh, land by 2030. So this this needs social tipping points um, at scale to uh, to push us past it here. So at the Exeter conference, we talked about social tipping points, um, uh, bringing together some some leading thinkers in, in communication, in strategy, in social sciences, um, in policy. Uh, uh, Nigel Topping was there from Exeter Zero um, uh, and others to um, to discuss this. And so we we, we got Solly down there incredibly um, actually. We, and it was like at the last minute we were saying you've got to come. And like, um, two weeks before she said, yeah, I'm coming. So Solly, over to you. Thank uh, you so very much. Um, uh, it's, it's a little difficult to stand on a panel after uh, Johan Rockstrop, but I'm going to try because those uh, environmental tipping points, um, in some ways, are, are what science is able to do is measure them much more in much more detail and understand the boundaries of them uh, much more clearly than perhaps we understand culture and neuroscience. Arguably, over the last 10, 15 years, there have been many, many more advances in climate science than there have been in neuroscience. We understand climate change to a level of detail much better than we understand what consciousness is or, what, or how human beings think. So one of the things which I often think about is that we have, um, we have as much a crisis of culture as we do of chemistry when it comes to climate change. And trying to work out the, how, to, uh, how, to, how to push for, how to encourage, how to uh, engage with social tipping points can be a little bit difficult to understand, which is one of the reasons why sometimes the social sciences look a little bit messier than sometimes uh, the chemistry or, or, or physical sciences. But uh, one of the things which became very clear also in IPCC and um, uh, AR6 in the demand side chapter, in chapter three, was the need for socio-cultural and behavior change. And in fact, um, if you read that, that, that chapter, it goes into a lot of detail about how some of that socio-cultural and behavior change might happen. And in fact, even states that we could save 5% of demand side carbon, which is up to 70% of carbon, rapidly through socio-cultural and behaviour change. Now, that's quite a lot of carbon. In fact, I was trying to look at, um, uh, uh, beyond a deployment of renewables, whether we had any other tools in our toolbox that would save that amount of carbon quickly. Um, how we do so is a little bit murkier. But uh, at the Tipping Points Conference, there was a lot of conversation about what could some of the interventions be that would get these human beings that have created climate change to take the obvious power that we have to do something about it. Now, um, I'm going to talk about some of the tools, particularly that communications can give us to doing so, because um, arguably um, we are not homo sapien, we are homo uh, narrativa, which is the storytelling ape, because stories are such a huge part of how we communicate. In fact, just yesterday we had a panel here with leading journalists talking about how incredibly influential journalism is on the story that we tell ourselves. Um, and then also to talk about well, if we can change that communication, um, what might some of the social tipping points be that we can tip over? So some of the highlights from the, um, the system was, number one, and perhaps this is obvious to say, but let's be honest, in the environmental movement, we don't always act as if this is true, is that everybody has a part to play in this. Everybody, or seven and a half billion of us, soon to be eight billion of us, will change how we live, change the choices that we make, change how we eat, change how we travel in order to confront this challenge. Now, there's some things we're not going to change. We're not going to change how we love. We're not going to change how we raise our children. We're not going to change the things which human beings innately care about. That stuff will all stay the same. In many ways, the things which matter most to human beings don't have to change that much as we, as we confront the challenges that Johan set out. But should we say, some of the organisational structures will have to, and everybody will be a part of that. And in some places in the world, people need to increase their consumption. People do not have access to the basic needs, which every human um, should have a right to. But the way, in though, the way in which they access that consumption will change. 
Secondly, is that within the realm of communicating these issues, both the problem and the solution, we have got to get much clearer, much simpler, and much more direct. We sort of love our esoteric language sometimes. You know, if you understand what PPM means, if you're part of you know the, the community who talks about the Albedo effect, it has a sort of um, a, a very human insider joy. Like people like to be inside of communities who have esoteric special knowledge. And we need to get out of that and to be able to actually spread that. And that not, that's not the responsibility of job of scientists. Scientists need to communicate the science in a way that is relevant and accurate and credible. It's the rest of our responsibility to take that and actually do the job for them. We do not want to try to turn um, scientists into sort of PR people. We have PR people for that. Um, we need to balance the absolute alarm, anxiety, crisis with the what we do about it message. Now that's something which is very close to Futera's heart. We did a massive survey um, around the world with Ipsos Mori where we discovered that 60% of people say they hear vastly more about the problem and they struggle to be able to say what the solution is. We've done a very good job at communicating the problem. And now the problem with what's happening in Puerto Rico right now, with what's been happening in, in Pakistan, the problem itself is doing the communication for us, actually. Climate change has become the major communicator of climate change. What we need to do is actually become better advocates for what the solutions are. And we really need to make sure that we are thinking about who the messengers are, not just the messages. Every community around the world needs to have people who are able to articulate these issues in a way that's relevant and reasonable and in the language of local communities. Um, there's a wonderful project going on trying to translate the IPCC beyond the eight official languages. Like literally, in places around the world, that it's, people are unable to read IPCC reports because it is not translated into their local language. Hundreds of languages are overlooked in how we communicate climate change. And to cooperate between science and outside of science. Science has so many of the answers here. The IPCC demand side chapter was a fantastic read. I have a postgraduate uh, degree in, in sustainability, um, and I was able to just about read it. Um, as we tell her, we did a translation for others who aren't able to get access to that information, because it was packed with the answers, but in a language that people um, can struggle to understand. So that's some of the how, but what are the actual social tipping points themselves that might bring about radical change within that rapid window that the IPCC is calling for. Rapid is sort of a very scientific word for really fucking quick. Because actually, um, uh, there isn't very much with it, but there isn't very much within the solutions agenda that the IPCC says can happen rapidly beyond this. Mainly because people can move much faster than technology can. It's take a very long time to deploy and build technology to scale. We can change overnight if we choose to. So one of the big tipping points which I see is the growing youth dissatisfaction. Um, the, the fact that climate change comes up again and again, in survey after survey after survey, is the number one global concern for under 30s around the world. Irrespective of whether there's a pandemic or a war going on, climate change still comes either at top or in the top three, and it does not for other generations. Now, um, Youth has always had different interests sometimes than um, other generations. But we are about to have a massive transfer of generations. So Gen Zs are already the largest demographic on the planet. There is more of them than there is of millennials, than of uh, Gen Xs, which I am who always get forget forgotten in this, <laughs> and the boomers. And so actually, we're about to have a whole set of new voters, new employees, uh, uh, new, new change makers, um, for whom climate change is a number one um, concern. And I don't think we've even begun to feel the ramifications of that as they begin to actually take some of the levers of power. We talk a lot about thanking and being inspired by the youth. Um, perhaps we should be scared of them because this is actually quite a significant change. Another one which is happening that so few people in our movement have noticed is Web3. So everyone sort of heard of Web3 and sort of gone, oh, does that mean that you know, there'll be a few more buttons on websites? Actually, Web3, and I've been doing some amazing work with um, Bettina Wahlberg, one of the sort of godmothers of Web3. Web3 is a complete restructure, rebuild of the internet. 
actually when we're operating in a web-free world, which we're not yet, the internet will operate in a very different way different way. And one of the core parts of Web3 is valuing intangibles, is actually being able to give a value to things that you make and create entirely within the virtual world, rather than there needing to be anything in the real world. Now, valuing intangibles is a terminology I'm very familiar with of 20 years of working in sustainability. We talk a lot about valuing intangibles, of valuing the intangible value of nature of valuing the intangible value of care work in society. Actually, if Web3 allows us to put a value on those intangibles, we might begin to find quite a quick um, transition in how, our, uh, in how our economics works. And anybody who thinks it won't be that big a deal is going, well, the internet's already been quite a big deal in how our economics works. And so Web3 and the transfer of how, um, of how value will be generated within Web3 is big. And the other big part of that is uh, consumption. So the IPCC also called out status consumption and conspicuous consumption as being a really significant driver of demand side emissions. Um, it can be quite difficult because most of us like to think that we don't buy much because of status consumption. You know, we buy what we need, etc. But the psychologists would tell us that a significant proportion of what we purchase is in some ways status driven or, or conspicuous driven. We are, after all, only apes, not angels, in terms of how we operate. And, and what we're beginning to see is, is for younger people, part of consumption moving to dematerialized consumption online, like the 200 billion that is spent within computer games every year. 200 billion being spent on something where the only material footprint is a data center. Now data centers are a big and significant part of the impact on climate change, but it is a much easier to plug a renewable power system into a data center, a fixed limited space, than it is to, for example, try to turn the fashion industry renewable. So, for example, the first dress, the first virtual dress has been sold online, no material consumption involved, and it costs £5,000. And there has been a huge demand for it, because it means when you take your selfie, you will actually be able to put this virtual dress on you. Thereby meaning that you don't have to buy a different uh, outfit for, e for each week, for each night, for when you go out. You can literally just dress yourself up. Now again, sustainability people tend to sometimes be a bit sniffy about this stuff. But if we can transfer status consumption to a dematerialized environment, rather than buying all of the cars, clothes, significant amount of investments that we make um, in the material world, that will have a really big impact. It's one of those tipping points that I feel like is coming with literally zero push or interaction from the sustainability movement at all. And the third one is the story. At the moment, the story that we have of climate change is a Frankenstein story. Man creates monster, then monster destroys man. It's the ancient Gollum story of Judaism. It's Godzilla as a story. Now, we tend as human beings to have a, a blueprint of stories in our heads. And we tend to actually work them through. You know, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get married. We tend to ha tell ourselves a story and then play it out. There's a lot of work being done on self-fulfilling prophecies of the stories we tell ourselves. So if we can move our story from a Frankenstein story to an adventure story, where actually the greatest adventure of our lives is going to be overcoming climate change and working back to live within the planetary boundaries. Not the vision of what we get at the end. That's lovely. Utopia is always lovely. But utopia is a bit boring. The adventure story of how we're going to get it is thrilling, it's exciting, and it's something within which everybody can feel that they can play a part. If that's the story we can start telling ourselves, perhaps it's a story that would allow some of the other technical tipping points we want to see in radical uptake of renewables, in changes to diets, in changes to how we travel and how we build, that story becomes the frame for some of those physical tipping points to happen. So I'm really enthusiastic about this social tipping points work. I think it's a bit of overdue for us to be working on it. And I think it's the other half of the story to the environmental tipping points which are going the wrong way. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. So let's open up for a conversation on this. Please, Solly, your hand, um, join us on stage. And, yeah. Um, and your name and where are you? Oh, um, so my name is Lucy and um, I am the initiator of a, a creative for climate 
And this reminds me of my experience when I first went to Extinction Rebellion's The Talk. I don't know if any of you here, do you know The Talk? The Talk is, is, is we have tipping points, tipping points exist, we're about to hit the tipping point, and the call to action is disrupt <laughs> and really participate in civil disobedience. And so for me, at a certain time, it made a lot of sense. I just didn't see anything else kind of moving fast enough. Um, and so I, I really think that like, in terms of the communicative movement, that like Extinction Rebellion deserves a little bit of credit for mobilizing so many people and someone like myself. Um, I found like another way to channel that energy and that urgency into something that I feel like could work with an existing system more. Um, but I just wanted to kind of uh, offer a solution that gives me a sense of, um, yeah, a way to rationalize what's going on. And I love this quote that if you pull at the thread, you start to unweave the whole system. And so I'm from New Zealand, Aotearoa, and there's a really strong decolonization conversation. And something that like, I do feel like is maybe missing in conversations here is like we really do need to look at like our colonial history and decolonization because indigenous communities offer so much knowledge in terms of new ways of looking. And I just really feel like if we continue to focus on climate tech or on other kinds of solutions within an existing system, we just won't get there. So yeah, I just feel that really strongly and I really hope that that conversation starts to become normalized. And I wanted to ask if it was a conversation that is happening at the highest level. So that was kind of my, my response. Thanks, Lucy. And this is, a, it's definitely at the frontier of the, of the scientific discussion. And let me try to pick a few pieces of what you're saying. And well, to begin with, there's a lot of uh, recognition that there is no safe climate landing unless we take on all the planetary boundaries. And the fundamental challenge is really to keep nature intact. I mean, it's so bad, actually, that even if we would phase out coal, oil, and natural gas, according to the exponential roadmap, we would still crash through 1.5, probably even 2 degrees, because we're losing the, the carbon stocks and, and, and the, the sink capacity in the ocean and, and terrestrial land systems. And we know that indigenous communities are less than 5% of the world population, but being stewards of over 80% of global biodiversity. And, and uh, you don't have to talk to the indigenous community to reconnect your life to the planet, while well, we have disconnected very much in the modern world. So, so that is one centerpiece. But the other one I wanted to reflect on, which is, I think there is something in between the storytelling and, and the scientific diagnostic, and that is how do you unleash exponential change? How, how, do, you, how do you embark ourselves on, on S-curves where we deliver on prosperity and equity in a way that is attractive, that we get the big masses on board. And just to give you the, the numbers here, at least as, as they're indicated, in, in any population, be it in the US or, or Germany, you have the extinction rebellion minority in one end, but you have in the other end a very small fraction of the denialists. And I would argue that the denialists, let's just forget about them. They are always there, they will always be there, the flat earth society will always exist. The, the extinction rebellions, are, are really important, but they are and will continue always to be a minority. Those are the, the environmentalists on the barricade. I, I admire them, I hooray them, but I won't join them because they will not lead to the transformation of the whole world. Because they um, are, are so, let's say, at the, at the frontier, many will call it extreme, that is perceived as if uh, sacrificing on, on the basics of life. So you need the actors like Peter Bucker sitting here, President of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, who is, who is operating in that 80% that of, of society, which is right in the middle. And how do you unleash innovations there that makes it possible for us to make the sustainability story the story that leads to a more modern, attractive, prosperous, and just world? You know, that is not a sacrifice. It's really a surfing along a positive journey. And, and that has to do with technology. It has to do with new system change. I mean, it's quite amazing that we haven't solved the energy crisis yet because it's the only environmental challenge that has perfect substitution. You know, who cares in this room whether the lights here are turned on with coal or with wind? We, we won't make a difference. So we have to kind of, I think, play all the cards. And we make the mistake of fragmenting this too much. We should think, when we, when we look at the social science and social tipping points, we know that large enough minorities can tip majorities. So you need to have the, 
the frontier barricade groups. You need to have the voices on the street, and you need to have all groups. And when they reach a level, and, and most indications are that between 15 and 20 percent, then the whole system tips, and you can start an irreversible journey towards the journey we want. But it will unleash business leaders to innovate on technology. But they do it because something has happened in that new storyline. So I think it's a question of, of not thinking that there's one blueprint, let's say one silver bullet here or one silver bullet there. It's a, it's a combined, so I think you've always been right, that one foot coming from the extinction part, but then kind of shifting over towards the more, what many wrongly call the mainstream. But you know, the mainstream is what has to deliver in, the, in my mind. I couldn't agree more. Just to briefly remind you the fact that in IPCC, in the most recent report, in, in, the, in the chapter which covers uh, storytelling and narrative in chapter five, they actually spend a lot of time looking at their indigenous narrative and actually talking about the fact that when we, when we do think about these stories, there is a great deal to learn. I'm so pleased to see that in IPCC because it's the first time that that's actually been acknowledged the fact that the story does not necessarily all have to come from one place, and there's a great deal that we can learn from the indigenous story um, uh, that, that the rest of us might need to actually take on board and, and spend some time with. Cool. We have two questions here, here and then Peter. Uh, is there a microphone? Yes. yes. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm uh, used to screaming very loud. <laughs> um, so Martijn Lopes, the CEO of the uh, Organization called Circle Economy, uh, publisher of, of the uh, Circularity Gap Report. Um, so maybe one uh, comment, an observation, and a question. Uh, so my comment is, I think you're really onto something, and the reason is, typically I'm either in sessions with communication people um, who run great platforms and. Um, and then, I, or I'm in sort of deeply scientific sessions. So the fact that we have, and sometimes they also don't want to sit next to each other. I do see a little chair in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think you're joined at the hip, and I think that's really powerful. And I think you're onto something. And I think well, more people are following you. I was at a private dinner at the Rocky Mountain Institute, and they're making massive investments on communication. Went from two to forty people in a year. In, you know, digging up all the scientific findings they have and bringing them to life and having storytelling and amplifying as a result of the message uh, tremendously. Um, then I had my observation, um, and by the way, with Circle Economy, we try to do the same. So I would argue Circularity Gap Report, you know, is it scientific? Yeah, it's grounded in science, but it brings a very popular, simple, maybe even oversimplified message, yet you know, if you look up in terms of articles, most of them are starting with the world is only eight to nine percent circular, and there is a big gap. That's all what people have to remember uh, to take action. You don't have to say there's 20 indicators and here's what they all say. Uh, you can do that, but that's for another audience. So my observation is the following: I've been sitting in quite a few sessions also this week and, 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 and uh, at WEF and at the Climate Week and um, also at the last COP. One of the observations I'm seeing is I think there's a tremendous traction with basically people replicating our existing society, but then based on hydrogen, renewables, I think Mission Possible is a great example. But then if you look at the end result, the challenge is like we're basically rebuilding out our complete economy. We have to build hundreds of hydrogen plants. We have to quadruple the renewable energy. And there's very little conversation in terms of uh, the consumption side. What can we really do to you know, reduce the amount of materials and energy we use? And my question is actually the following. Um, how can you, and maybe it's uh, for both of you, um, have some of those emotional drivers that, um, that, that trigger that overconsumption and put them leverage the same type of emotional drivers into a more sustainable way of living without it really feeling as a sacrifice for scarcity. Uh, so okay. that's my question. And uh, oh, wait, before taking that, can Peter? Yeah, thank, thanks so much for this morning. I mean, I know everything has to change and everyone has to change, but we also know that change is slow, and yet if I read the tipping point paper, eight more years and the world is fucked, you know? So, 
what are we going to, what are the three things the world must stop doing now so that we get a much more focused conversation because you know, everybody is now happy they have 2050 commitments and some kind of target for 2030. But we need to get a more focused agenda because so what, would, what would be your focus point? Cool. Yeah. Well, should I take one of those and you take the other? Yeah, okay. um, so I, I actually have a paper about this morning and an op-ed in New Scientist about exactly this. Like, how do we remember that human beings are just apes, not angels? And trying to convince people to make these decisions based on sort of their morality is quite challenging when we're nothing other than a member of the great ape species. And we have all of these drives and, and needs that, are, that have been evolved into us. And my argument is to go with them. Actually, things such as status symbols are incredibly valuable. We've had huge numbers of different ones all through history, from blackening teeth to binding feet to peacock's feathers. Like there's a huge, huge, huge number of ways that we can change what those status symbols symbols could be, where we can change what a desirable life look, looks like, where we can change what people aspire to. What you can't change is their desire for status symbols, our desire for these things. Those are programmed in. You just change how we fulfill them. And I think we forget how quickly and malleable those things can be. And we also forget how quickly a society can change. So I'm sitting here, um, I'm a woman. You know, a generation ago, would I have been sitting up on a platform like this? It's like we, 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 you're all sitting there with your laptops in front of you. We've managed to change, even in our lifetimes. The internet's the same age as I am. Massively changed our daily behaviours, how we communicate with each other, how we trade. Fundamentally, we've changed our buildings, we've changed our entire economic system with this new technology within a lifetime. Human beings have this weird piece of thinking that our societies are difficult to change, even when we've lived through radical changes within them. So I'm really hopeful that as long as we go with the grain of the fact that we're nothing other than animals and great apes and there's certain desires that need to be filled, as long as we go with that grain, actually some of the um, materials within which we fulfill those could be changed overnight. Yeah, thanks. Well, as, as, as <clears throat> both you and I have been talking a lot about, Peter, the, the real frustration is not only that we have all the scientific evidence that we're approaching the, these irreversible these points of no return, it's also that, that the answer to your question is quite simple. And, um, and ju just to refer also, so you've heard it, I mean, we, we published this week the 50-year update of the Limits to Growth Report, the Earth for All Report, that, that tries to answer this question in the five big turnarounds that are required. Uh, we run a conference just as we speak down at the Javits Center, the Global Futures Conference, it's Arizona State University with the Earth League, trying to define the 10 must-haves What's the plan B if the world wakes up one morning and recognizes that, oh shit, we're pushing this too far? What do we have to take off the shelf? Because all resilience science shows that when you're in a crisis, what determines whether you transform in a positive way or collapse is whether the solutions have been curated and are ready to, do, to be implemented. That's, that's the only way to use a crisis in a positive fashion. Everyone loves to talk about, let's not, let's not misuse this crisis. But, but we generally never use the opportunity because we don't have the solutions. But what would be the top three in my mind? Well, the number one is, is clearly to get rid of the five trillion US dollars of subsidies that go straight into the fossil fuel driven world economy. And that's a quite an easy decision to take, actually. Just stop supporting doing wrong. I mean, that, that would be, I think, the, the number one. The number two is, is, I mean, the World Business Council have been trying this a lot, is, is just halt the expansion of agriculture. Just say that from now on we must have a moratorium on, on the 50% of remaining intact nature on land. Because if we, if we lose that, we lose everything. So that, that's number two. And then number three is put money on the table. You just have to support the global south in this transition. I mean, we tend to be so, you know, the situation right now is really dangerous. We have inflation, <clears throat> economy going down the drain, energy prices rising, and how do the rich nations react? Well, they react by backing off their pledges and commitments. They start using money, taxpayers' money, to reduce gasoline prices. They use money to be able to reduce electricity prices and, and open up new coal. Well, that sends the signal to the African nations that, well, if you rich guys cannot cope as soon as you get a little disturbance, why would we do anything? So, of course, COP27 is, is at risk of collapsing because the global south was not seeing that the, that the rich countries were all delivering. 
So the third part in my mind is <clears throat> put the money on the table so that the credit, credit worthiness of developing countries is as such that they can afford investing in renewable energy systems and deliver in the North. The North must deliver. And the North is not so big. It's Germany, it's the US, it's the UK, it's Australia. And I'm saying just a few of the big um, wealthy economies must show that this, this is really necessary. It gives us advantages and we, we generate a more competitive industry and citizens become actually in the end happier. You know, that has to happen. And, I, and, and so in a way, it's, it's quite easy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thanks Johan, thanks Ole. And, uh, you know, you know I, I'm incredibly sometimes, I think, I'm an optimist about things. I'm an optimist about humanity. And as you say, Solly, we've made progress on, on gender. We've made progress on poverty. We've made progress on, on the ozone hole. So, you know, we can do it. Um, and I often think, you know, um, humanity always does, um, does the right thing. But usually not until we've run out of all other alternatives. Um, and that, but that's the state we're in right now. I mean, we've run out of all other alternatives. We have to make progress on this. It has to be exponential, uh, and we need to cross these tipping points. So just to finish, you know, the Exeter Conference was the first, um, and it's going to be the first in a series. You know, this uh, it was a very, very powerful um, meeting, and we're going to um, we're thinking about holding them annually, bringing together um, system scientists, earth system scientists. Uh, social system scientists, um, uh, advocates, communicators, policy makers um, to, to help put together and drive this agenda. Um, but thank you so much for joining. Sorry we're over time, um, but um, it's been great ch chatting to you.